got to go down. All right, uh, we'll move on to our Reverend Catchment Management Activity. Um, I welcome Emily O'Donnell, our manager, Hodaki Coromandel Catchments, Grant Blackie, our manager, Waikato West Coast Catchments, and Julie Bofel, our manager of the Shovel Ready Work Program, um, to the floor. Um, and look, we've, we've talked a lot about infrastructure um, in the previous paper around some of the impacts on our work program. Um, what you'll hear through this paper is that um, a majority of impacts for the Waikato region from these events has been less about our infrastructure, which has actually coped pretty well um, in terms of levels of service, uh, but more so around our rivers and catchment um, and the, the um, short and long term damage that we've seen um, to our schemes. Karatato, morning everybody. I haven't met everyone yet, but I'm Grant Blackie. Um, I'd take the report as read with the permission of the chair and just touch on a few points and my colleagues will add in where they need to. I feel a bit like the thorn between two roses, so thank you ladies. Yeah. Um, uh, as Patrick mentioned, these are interim type reports. We provide a bigger report. All of our work is up to 30th of June. We have a lot of reports to our funders and the council and you guys following the 30th of June. So we typically provide a bigger report with all our work, our year's outputs. Uh, next meeting, September, I think it is. In, in between times, we have these interim reports. Um, there are eight zones and five zone managers, as you probably know. And I think Dodie online and Chloe Wilson. Kerry over here for Waikato West Coast. Um, there's a massive amount of work currently underway, trying to get finished for the end of the year. And, you know, planning's into full swing now. And other jobs, it's getting a bit wet to complete anything else just at the moment. You may have seen in the paper lately, in the Herald, I think it was um, 2.86 million we were from MPI in relation to the Hill Country Erosion Fund projects. That builds on the back of earlier Hill Country Erosion Fund projects, and it's essentially lowering the cost for landowners to implement work across something like 2,000 hectares next four years to reduce erosion and to provide you know other biodiversity gains as well along the way. Um, we did actually get that decision back at the end of last year, but MPI have only um, wanted to announce it now. It's taken six months to get contracts signed, et cetera. So that's been a bit of a, a job. Um, the years, as you heard, the year's been dominated by storm events, not so much in my zones, but more so in Emily's. Um, and that's upset work programs and diverted resources essentially onto dealing with um, storm damage responses. We do have a couple of slides we'll um, run through just in terms of some photos, and then we'll take questions and just go from there. This is actually one of them. Uh, kia ora koutou. nice to be here in person and to see um, some familiar faces, uh, to reconnect with those and, and to, to, to make acquaintances with some new. Um, just before I go into these slides, I just want to uh, acknowledge the thanks and support that we've had, uh, particularly from members of this committee. Uh, for zones like the Coromandel Zone, we've been in some form of flood uh, response or remediation since May last year, not this May, unfortunately. Um, so it's it's really wonderful to, to hear the sentiment and the concern for the teams and acknowledging their workload. Uh, and I'll, I will be feeding that back. Um, Grant's already touched on it about the impact of the weather events uh, and what that'll mean for our work program. So signalling that for Hauraki Coromandel Catchment New Works, we're likely to be underspent. But uh, not surprisingly, river management will be uh, well and truly spent, um, providing we can actually get on site um, to, to carry out that work. So we thought we'd just put together some examples of what the team are experiencing and what our responses are at the moment. So this one here, uh, and one that'll be familiar to you, Mr Chairman, having had a field visit out to Komata, is uh, you can see here in the, the top photo, the significant gravel management that's required for the Komata River in Hauraki, so that's uh, near Hikataya, for those not familiar with the area. Um, and this is this is pretty typical of some of these uh, heavy, heavily burdened uh, gravel streams. Um, but you know, we're talking weeks worth of work here just to manage the gravel there, and then your really typical uh, river management blockage um, and, and challenge there around debris uh, with that tree down the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, again, this is uh, following uh, impact from, from weather events. The first, uh, the photos on the, the left hand side uh, with the digger and the, our work vehicle below, that's on the Coromandel. So this is following Cyclone Gabriel and significant um, debris in rivers. Uh, the yurt the gives a nice kind of scale in terms of the, the slash of material that was in the Parakai stream uh, near Whenuakete and above there at the Yaki Yaki. Uh, and so, you know, large, large volumes having to be dealt with, um, high health and safety risk, uh, lots of sort of uh, challenges for the team to deliver that work. And then the images on the right from the Waipa zone, just those typical debris dams that, um, you know, that by the team being able to get in and remove that early on, we're able to um, mitigate further risk and further damage. Uh, so really, really critical proactive work there. Next slide, please. Um, we'll put these together because it sort of paints a bit of a picture around uh, cause and effect. Uh, that the first little photo there with that um, pump shed teetering on the edge, um, that's sort of almost the, oh, yep, we've got a plan here. We'll do some work with the landowner. Um, two or three weather events later, the photo below it, uh, that shed's disappeared and the scale of the job got a whole lot bigger and, and a whole lot more expensive. And, and Kerry and I were just talking about this before that the team are going in, they're costing out a job, that might be five grand, they're coming back after another event and suddenly that's a, a $30,000 job if you can get rock to the site given the vulnerabilities of the road. Um, the, the very muddy looking photo, that's the Farikawa uh, Harbour. So we happen to have our coastal science team out in the catchment doing routine monitoring of estuarine systems and that was what they were able to visually see within the harbour environment. So for that area in terms of biodiversity impact, water impact, um, you, you know, you're visually seeing the impact of shellfish beds, seagrass beds, those sorts of things um, uh, dying before your eyes. So the remediation work there was a mix um, of, of gravel work and there's some further work upstream and the team are doing quite a lot of hydro seeding as well. You'll note, and I, I like these photos because um, our contractors struggle with this, we ask them to leave the site a bit messy. Um, which for a contractor who likes things nice and even is, is really hard, but this is critical in terms of in-stream habitat. And I guess it's um, a real change in the approach to river management in the last 10 or 15 years is those in-stream and biodiversity benefits as we go along. And I'll hand over to, to Grant to talk about some of the catchment work. Next slide, please. This is actually one of Kerry's sites. This is a site down by Kafia just retiring a bit of uh, erosion prone land next to Kafia Harbour. And it's getting planted probably soon this week. Get a bit closer, there you go. Um, the photo with the guy in it, that's Ruben. He's an intern from Punyu River Care. So one of our funding arrangements is that we take an intern for three months each year for the next four years. And it's partly to just upskill uh, their knowledge on what the council does and they can take that back to their organisation or potentially it provides a pathway for those um, staff working for these sorts of groups who may actually end up getting a job with the council. He's a good guy, he's been out, that's uh, just been out checking fences and we GPS all the fences so we know where they are. Um, next slide, please. This is a photo going back to 2000 and I think what's the date on the first one, 2017? Yeah, um, this is way back. I actually emailed a whole lot of beekeepers, all the beekeepers we could find and said, if you want, got some steep hill country and it's in a priority area and you want to plant manuka for Sering. Yeah, we got a very limited response, but this couple did. They had 40 hectares down by Kafia. Planted it with small grade manuka, which is tiny. It's just like little plants about that big. And you plant the area and you can't even see them for the first couple of years. And the landowner often they want to put their cattle back in and graze them but um, the photos are two years apart so if you work your way uh, across and then down and across so you can see how the area doesn't look like much after two years you're starting to see a bit of uh, manuka after four years and then after six years it is actually looking like very good coverage there's a few gaps for um, access and places to put hives and things but it's a relatively cheap way of establishing cover we typically um, put in a 20% mix of other species now to give a longer, you know, to give more of a 
transition into other um, longer term vegetation. A lot of these areas are near existing bush areas and the birds will bring in other seeds, but um, yeah, manuka in itself won't, won't be the ultimate answer. But it is a cheap way of changing land use and it's been pretty successful on that site. The gorse just disappears with a little bit of shading. Next slide, please. That's actually one of yours, Emily. must have been the one sunny day we had um, on the Coromandel. So the, the team are uh, starting to use technology a bit more. Um, so for, for quick and efficient ways and for data capture, so using drones to do catchment surveys. And uh, the photo below is, is um, when, when I started as a catchment management officer um, too long ago, I, uh, some wise people said to me, sometimes you've just got to give it time or you've got to wait for the landowner to change. Um, and, and so this is a real classic one. This is where Elaine came to me and said, you know that wetland, that headwater wetland in Coromandel Town that you've been waiting forever, um, that they've retired it. And it was a case of great timing and um, one of our senior CMOs doing what she does best and that she's a great farmer charmer um, and encouraging them to retire this entire headwater um, wetland. Thank you. Next slide, please. Just before we pass on to Julie, so at the end of the report, oh well, I've skipped through, I haven't gone through the report at all, but there is updated commentary on where the finances are for each zone and zone by zone comments on how the program is going at this point in the year. And at the back, there is a list of shovel ready restoration projects. So Julie is the project manager for our shovel ready restoration um, program. That's a term we throw around. You might not all know what it means, but the shovel ready projects came out of the government's um, COVID recovery package. We got our hands on lots of money to help landowners do lots of things, not only in the restoration space, but also in the infrastructure um, area. But there's a big list of projects, uh, restoration projects at the back of the report, which um, are all at various stages of completion or progress. That um, comes under Julie's some management skills as a starting point, so I'll pass over to Julie on that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Um, kia ora tato. Um, my name's Julie Bofal, and as Grant said, I'm managing the Shovel Ready Program. It's a combination of restoration projects and um, infrastructure projects um, to be delivered over five years as part of the government's COVID recovery funding. Um, and it's across it's it's a it's across the region. So turn it up. Closer. Very close. Very close. Is that better? Okay. Um, hopefully caught most of that. I've got the gist. Um, so uh, so as I was saying, it's a regional uh, approach um, to delivering a program of projects funded through the government. Um, along with funding from um, council through our rates and other funders such, such as the WRA, Fonterra, et cetera. Um, I've been asked today to just to give a, a bit of an overview uh, around one particular area, and that's um, the iwi and social enterprise journey that we embarked on with Shovel Ready. It's connected closely to our social procurement policy as a council where we're you know, really interested in growing growing our region. It's about growing our region. It's about the relationships we have with Māori, Pacifica, and social um, enterprises. And so this is just a, a quick snapshot of what um, we've learnt over the last three years and where, where we're heading. Let's go ahead, please. So um, we um, have had kind of, it's been quite a, a learning curve for some of us. Um, uh, where, where we've had relationships with external funding um, and social enterprises in parts of the region, so you know, like the Waikato, um, less of a learning curve, but still some challenges um, here and there. Um, and it's been a, a bit of a, a fast road to hoe because we had money um, that we had to, where we had to stand projects up very quickly. Um, so that meant that we as a council had to move quickly and also our social, iwi and social enterprises had to um, move quickly if they wanted to take part and um, reap some of the benefits of the accelerated funding. Next slide, please. Um, so what's worked well? 
for us as a council, um, we did manage to stand things up quickly. Um, we've, bought, we've built relationships with entities that we had not previously come into contact um, with in a, in a significant way. So a good example of that is the Pacific Business Forum, um, who've um, engaged in some of our infrastructure projects. Um, we have had to um, provide additional support to suppliers um, from time to time and adapt to how to their needs. Um, and we've created um, knowledge sharing um, ex, um, um, opportunities between um, providers as well. So that's that's worked well from our perspective. For the entities themselves, a um, bit of a challenge for them to um, engage in some of our procurement processes. They've needed some help in, in some instances there. Uh, they have responded really well to growing their businesses or to setting up new businesses. So they really appreciated that opportunity and wanted to make the most of it. That's resulted in a creation, the creation of jobs. So most of our contracts uh, have gone locally. They're within the region. Um, we have 90 um, contracts that we've let so far. Uh, we've created um, in excess of 180 FTEs, the equivalent of, uh, you know, in excess of 100 and might even be more than that, 90 FTEs. Um, so that's that's really ticked that box of what government was trying to do in terms of. Um, keep people in jobs and grow grow jobs. Um, and I suppose just as a summary statement, you know, where we've seen the highest rate of success has been where those entities um, were already set up, um, where they already had a good business model in place, a history of working with us, um, and were able to um, respond in a in a um, planned way to to the opportunity. And and so a learning there has been that you know that takes that takes time and we're just seeing some of the, the newer ones are only really coming to their um, fore now. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges, as I said, some of our staff have had to learn as they go. Um, we've um, found that uh, a lot of time has needed to be put into some um, iwi and social enterprises. Um, they've grown too quickly in some instances and they've needed um, more support, they've just found things a little bit challenging. Um, so that's caused a risk and actually manifest a manifestation of delay um, in some projects and even um, where they, you know, situations where they haven't been able to deliver. So we've had to look at alternatives. I mean, the, the thing is we have our contract set up um, with that and, you know, with all of the risks in mind, I suppose. And so we've been able to um, navigate our way through that but it does still cause additional um, work and some time challenges. And I think the other thing for us is that, you know, when we're working with an iwi enterprise, for example, you know, we may have a relationship with them as a council, but when you move into a contractual relationship, that can be, you know, quite a different kind of scene. And so, um, and harder for, for, some, uh, for some of them to really, um, they still see us as the, as the government representative and um, that relationship holder, um, the, it's harder for them to understand when we're saying, hey, we've got these um, contractual obligations to adhere to. Uh, and for the entities themselves, look, to be to be completely fair, they, you know, coming and working with council is a bit of a, a big ask, you know, from the outside looking in um, for some of them. And so, um, you know, even our procurement processes um, look a little bit bewildering, so we've um, made additional efforts to help them with those. Uh, they've expanded quickly as well, um, a number of them, and that's proven the challenges I've mentioned. And, you know, even just a, a business approach where they may have multiple contracts with us, so they've got multiple people to deal with at Council when we have staff, you know, across the region. So they, you know, just, just responding to... Um, that volume of connection is has been a bit of a challenge. Next slide, please. And so just, you know, what's next? Um, as I as noted at the beginning, this is a journey and it does have bumps in the road, but it's a journey that council is committed to. Um, and so we just need to, we need to keep moving forward. We've learned a lot through the shovel ready process. There are other um, processes as well that, um, we take learnings from, we'll continue to refine and adapt and make sure our staff are supported as well in, 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 those, um, in that adaptation. Um, and I just wanted to note that there is actually a long-term plan strategic idea proposal 
um, that you you will come across that um, is about building capacity with iwi and um, stakeholders. And um, my hope is that we will have um, some support through that proposal to support our staff and, and our um, iwi and social enterprises in doing business together. Um, because if that's where we want to go, we need to we need some help. We need some help with it to make it um, work to the, um, the the best that we can. And finally, just a, a few um, quick slides of some of our successes, just some photos. Um, the first one is our Nawaya Waikato project in the Lower Waikato, really close relationship with Waikato Tainui there, and um, um, you can see planting teams there. They have gone great guns. Um, it's been a highly successful project. Just this season alone, we'll see around 250,000 plants going into that um, Lower Waikato area. The next slide, please. Um, this is the Karapiro Manganua catchment um, project with Ngāti Hawa Mahi Trust. This was an iwi inter, inter, enterprise that was already set up. They had a nursery. With the shovel-ready funding, they were able to expand their nursery and their planting teams. Again, a very highly successful um, project. And the last one is our Manaya um, project, where we've worked closely with uh, Ngāti Whanonga and Ngāti Pukenga. Sorry, just the last slide, please. Oh, that was OK. Missed that one. It's a good one. <laughs> and, and five FTEs alone created with that Manaya um, project. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that uh, report and, and thanks for those pictures of the of the successful endeavors at the end. That's always nice to see. Um, so the social procurement was a, a requirement of the sho shovel ready um, application, wasn't it? Yes. So given what you've shared with us in terms of some additional delays or risks or niggles mm -hmm. um, in that, have we taken any opportunity to provide feedback to central government of the impact of that requirement on, on the outcomes? Yes, and um, we did that fairly early on, actually, because it became apparent that it was going to be a challenge. And, and from my perspective, what was interesting was that all of our funding agreements were um, four different government um, ministries required us to meet certain social procurement um, targets. Um, but there's no, when you actually start looking at your region um, and looking into that part of um, our region, there's actually not a lot of government support, central government support mm -hmm. um, to do that. So it was a big ask for them to put that on us. Right. Um, and and we were encouraged to work with the Ministry for Social Development, and we did to start with, but that was limit, you know, that was limited. And so our feedback to them has been, you guys need to invest in, um, right. in this as well. We we're, we're doing this, but we need your help. And the yeah. and the well, and, and if it was led from central government, then there would be consistency yes. across the country, as mm. opposed to each region going through the the learning process and coming up with a a um, specific approach to it. So um, I'm glad that we've sent that message uh, back loud and clear. I think we need to, as council, continue to uh, provide that feedback. Bruce. Yeah, well, thanks for that report. So I'm interested in the perpetuity, in perpetuity approach and the bumpiness and the nature of jobs for nature. Money comes to an end, money starts again, you know, it moves all around the place. So was the other project you were referring to one which is going to assist in building the planting infrastructure so it's more permanent and able to weather these sudden shifts and changes in central government funding? Yes, so so one of the very real challenges with the um, COVID recovery funding was that um, it created so much interest, you know, so, and, and, and a lot of risk for new new entities who don't have um, good business models in place already because they were set up responding to that massive investment. And our worry has been that when that investment comes to an end, and for us, um, our projects, we're starting to close out projects now. Um, and so, you know, that, um, that money is not going to be there to continue to inject into the community. So we we passed that back to our central government contacts very early on as well. Um, something they've been mindful of, and they've been doing some limited work um, with um, other um, 
their networks, I suppose, uh, um, nationally. Um, but um, I guess as a council, we have built quite a relationship with some of these entities and we, um, as part of our ongoing programs, will be using and relying on um, their delivery, their services and their delivery models. So, um, so I think there's probably um, it's a bit it's a bit varied. I think we'll see some dropout, um, but I think we'll see the ones that have um, really got good business models in place and good relationships will hopefully continue to thrive. And do you consider that the current delivery is adequate for the scale of the problem in the region? <laughs> oh, no. oh, look, we, I mean, we could do a, yeah, I mean, well, you've seen it today. There's, um, we, we can always do with more money. The thing is, we as a council as well need to be geared up to respond to that. If we were to get an injection of funds again, we need to make sure that we can cope with that. And so you'll be familiar that we'd applied for another tranche of funding through the River Managers um, Group. And we're not sure yet what that um, looks like in terms of how last week's budget. But um, what we did based on our learnings with Shovel Ready is we um, built into our um, bid um, the funding and resources to enable a team of people and the resources we need to be able to deliver that. And we were working um, on the basis that a number of these entities would also be still um, in a position to support our work. Yeah, well, the point is the soft infrastructure isn't going to, the need's not going to go away. It's actually going to continue to increase and uh, for our region to be successful in responding to the sorts of things we're experiencing at the moment. This sort of infrastructure, a different sort of infrastructure, needs to be fully embedded into our region. So uh, this, is, this is the beginning of something way bigger, I believe. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Thank and through you, Mr. Chair, you're you're speaking to uh, uh, an audience with a very open mind around that because from our point of view, um, you know, it's not just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff stuff. We see the value um, yeah, because many of us have been here for decades. See the value of the um, the work that ha um, needs to be done in the upper catchments. You, Stu. Yeah. Look, very. Very similar vein to Bruce. He said a lot of things. I was going to say. Um, I just want to say I, I really appreciate the report, Julie. And and look, I've seen firsthand in the Karapiro catchment the, the challenges of social procurement. But and most of the landowners who have got on the phone had a bit of a grumble to me about it. Understand the the multifaceted objectives here. Eh? And I think if we don't, as you've acknowledged, look at all the different options to build on what we've created out of the shovel-ready funding, um, then it will, it will be a waste of time, you know. And it, look, at the end of the day, we're, we're a branch of, of government, um, and if we can, uh, as if, I think this is a um, yeah, sort of a journey, a means to an end, for want of a better word, I suppose. It's probably the wrong word to use, but um, I absolutely think we need to um, to build on this. Um, and look, it is a bit frustrating that Rather than a gradual increase in funding, there's a whole bunch of funding, and it's probably going to bloom and stop. But um, but if we can capitalise on all those relationships that you guys have built and 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 turn this into a long-term thing, then then I think um, we, we've got an obligation as a council to, to keep down that road. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I definitely um, what you both Bruce and um, Stu both said is. Soft infrastructure is going to become more um, needed in our, our couchments in the future for fresh water and everything. Um, all the other policies that are coming towards us that we're going to have to deal with as well. So, um, thank you very much for your reports, and we um, thanks for your tra travels all the way down here today um, from Coromandel. Um, yeah, it's um, and we've all. I think everyone, and it's not just the councillors here today, all of council, when we've been sitting around the table, we've been sitting up and looking what's going on at the Coromandel and going, holy crap, those poor buggers are up there dealing with that all the time. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's how I think most of us have felt all the time. Yeah, so thanks for coming down today. Cheers. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So, um, All in favour?
All right, through you, Mr Chair. Um, so you've heard in both of those papers that um, we've had some pretty substantial work program impacts um, due to the events. Um, and so what we have, I think what some questions have touched on is the fact that we do have additional work um, coming at us and, um, and Council has set itself up to provide for that additional work in some cases, depending on the size of the event, and that's through our disaster recovery reserves. We have zone based reserves um, and we also have a, a regional reserve, which is tagged to much larger events. What you have, uh, there will be a, a, a several papers that come to Council um, over time and as we're able to get um, work, get remedial work completed, um, bring those costs together and um, uh, uh, present to you the case, noting that um, the request for drawdown of reserves is often a retrospective um, act as opposed to um, bringing that work um, in before we actually undertake um, that remedial action. Um, so what we have today is a, a request from the WIPAR zone, um, and that is actually covering um, quite a number of events since February 22, um, so bringing together that. Um, you will note that it, it refers to both zone and regional um, reserves. Um, however, what we'll be doing today is looking for support for the um, zone-based reserve, um, given that there will be a much wider discussion that's required around, around our regional reserve, uh, because as you can guess from the papers we've presented today, um, there will be a number of zones that will be looking to make a call on that regional reserve um, and that needs to be looked at holistically. Um, I'd also note in terms of the process that effectively this is the um, uh, requesting support um, for that um, drawdown to occur, noting that the actual formal process to give effect to it is through um, Council's forecasting um, process, which is approved through the Finance and Services Committee. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kerry Nielsen, our zone manager for WIPA zone. Um, and should we no, no, we'll just like a question first. Um, well, the, the issue for me was that we will consider all the um, zones at one time in the future um, to look at the, the reserves so that there's equity amongst the applications. But with the greatest respect, a comprehensive report easily understood, and I'm quite happy to move it without, and I'm not trying to take away your presentation, but it's comprehensive, it's within the zone. Uh, and um, the the bigger picture is to be dealt with at a later time. Thank More you than for the comprehensive report. So it's, uh, I don't want to cut her off, but it's self-explanatory. Beginning. Thank you. Uh, we can still have the discussion. Yeah. So Stu. Oh, thanks. Oh, um, did you want to add anything, Kerry, or because I was just looking at. <laughs> No, I. <laughs> well, oh, we should always all on favour. Next, next time, oh, next time, I'd I'd like to see the um, the not Nick Rashford do of the reserves done and what it's projected to do because I have no doubt that um that you're quite comfortable with taking the the main I thought we're taking the main reserve um or the disaster reserve back to zero, but when we're taking money from the operational reserve. We need to know what the long. We all need to be comfortable that we're on the on the right pathway in terms of what we're doing with that res those various reserves and what they're intended to be used for. I wasn't sure if it was a slip of the tongue when you said we should be allocating money from the disaster reserves proportionally across the region. I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing because they're, they're there for need. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, those graphs are such a wonderfully simple way of us monitoring what's going on with those reserves because we have had scenarios in the past where councils made a decision to, to mine a reserve for one of a better words, but crude. And then two years later, we've run into a bit of a problem. And then, but council's forgotten that they <laughs> approved that decision to, to mine the reserve. So we, we just need to be kept up to speed with what they're we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and through the chair, we can put together something on the plan for the WIPA operational reserve that includes the impact of this um, replenishment of the disaster reserve yeah. um, at a future meeting. Yeah, yeah. But across yeah. all the reserves, all the eight zone yeah. reserves. Thanks, Kerry. No, just adding to that, uh, look, Stu, that's probably the one thing that I've um, gone through and I've been writing all over this, trying to work out uh, what the impact uh, is on. So, a good point. So, thank you for raising that. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Delightful. <laughs> all, in, all in favour? Right.
Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Grant. Um, so, so three, Mr. Chair. So, the last paper that we have today. Um, just sorry, Greg. I just got to one last question, Kerry. On um, discipline and graph. There's just uh, some terminology. Um, the different parts of the um, of the YPAR zone. We talk about um, flows exceeded 20% of AEP, but but less than 5% AEP, and et cetera, et cetera. I got a bit confused by that terminology. Yeah, so that was probably, I just threw the tear, that was probably one thing that I did want to just clarify if I was going to speak to this is, is the, the probability of an event happening in any one year. So we're often used to saying it's a one in 100 year flood um, or otherwise there's a 1% probability that, that an event would happen in any one year. So when we say between a 20% and 5% annual exceedance probability, that means in any one year there's a t between a 20 and 5% chance that that event would happen in that area. Also, so you're saying it's between 5 and 20, for example, when it says exceeded 20 AEP, but less than 5 AEP. It's a yes, the so right there's, a, there's a 5 to 20% chance that it would happen yeah, in any one year. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, look, I'll just bang on again, and you'll probably hear me in the future, but I get really annoyed when people use 100 year and 20 year because it's, you know, if, if it's a 100 year, it's it's, you know, there's 3.65 days in any one year that it could be that. Yeah. So it's every year that could happen. Yes. And, and it's not 100 years. So I would like to see us stop using that 100 year event and 20 year event and 10 year event. It's how many times are likely to happen in any one year. That's right. Yeah. So that's why I thought it was useful to use that probability of an event happening. Yeah. And our um, level of service for drainage, I think, is to clear mm -hmm. a 10 year event within three days. So, you know, like I'd just like to make sure that we don't lose sight of that um, as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So our last paper today, I'll welcome Dave back to the, Dave Wade back to the chair. Um, so this covers our asset management maturity journey. Um, you've heard already a little bit about our infrastructure and the work that we do um, around uh, understanding and planning for uh, maintaining the level of service through our infrastructure. Um, there's this well-established international benchmark around the different aspects that cover the way that we manage as, um, um, assets. Um, the purpose of this paper is to provide you an update of where we're currently at. Um, we started this journey, um, gosh, it's probably getting on 10 years ago now, in terms of assessing ourselves against this benchmark, um, as well as setting ourselves a goal to move forward. Um, and what you'll see in this paper is um, where we're at at the moment, and also um, indicating a plan for continuing to move forward to meet the areas that, we, um, that we've identified through this assessment. So thanks, Dave. All right, thanks for the intro, Greg. Um, firstly, Mr Chair, I'd like you to accept the reports read. Um, what I'm going to do is just talk through the process a little bit. Um, in, in terms of the technical detail, I'll, I'll try to make it as lay, layman terms as, as possible. Um, I guess the essence of asset management really mm. is to make sure that we're employing the right approach, the right systems, um, the right processes to make sure we maximise the, uh, the the spend and the effectiveness of our assets. Um, could I have the next slide, please? The way this is um, framed is through the um, International Infrastructure Management Manual, um, which underpins basically an international standard. So. Um, it's great that we're following that international standard. It's globally recognised as the best practice in terms of how we, we manage our assets. Um, it's um, been advised by Treasury that uh, we follow this approach. Um, the assessments generally um, are an internal assessment and we're advised um, on a f uh, reasonable frequency basis that we, we get external validation. So we've had several of those. Um, in the report, we talk about the most recent one, the 2022 um, report, um, which was compiled by ACOM. Um, the scoring really is based around a number of set questions, so it's very structured. Um, Treasurer has developed a spreadsheet which sets out those questions. And so we, we set to try to answer them as openly and honestly and make sure we've got enough fact and data to, to back up our responses. Um, as I say, the internal assessments are um, with our own staff, mainly from our asset management team. Um, 
but we also involve people from risk and assurance as well. Next slide, please. So there are 17 aspects to this, um, basically in three sections. So the first part really is talking about the, the operating environment and how we set direction. Um, I'm sure if you can read those slides, but that basically talks to how we uh, develop the priorities or set priorities for asset improvement. The green portion there in the middle really talks to how we actually deliver on that. Um, and then the pink portion or red um, talks to the structure systems and processes that we use to underpin it. You'll probably be aware that we've um, established a continuous improvement governance group. So that comprises of um, the senior leadership team in ICM. Um, and we meet monthly and talk about the progress we're making on uh, aspects of this framework. Next slide, please. Next. Next. So just to give some background, um, the uh, KPMG um, did a, an audit back in 2017. Um, you can just do the next slide, please. That was the, the essence of the audit, a lot of red. I won't talk through all of the detail, but fair to say there was plenty of opportunity for improvement. Um, you know, clearly the, the key focus for us was to pick on the elements that were going to give us uh, the most benefit um, and that would give us the, um, the greatest move forward. Um, we've been working through those actions um, ever since and checking our progress. Um, if you can have the next slide, please. Um, and as you can see here, we use criteria to, to measure. It's not about the score. The score is, is a relative um, indicator for us. And we've set some fairly lofty goals of 79% maturity. We're currently sitting at around 64%. Um, and I'll explain that a bit later. Um, so we have made some, some headway. Um, there's still plenty of opportunity. Our target is conservative. We're not aiming to be the best, um, but we are aiming to be at a level where we have confidence. Next slide, please. As you can see, the journey here over the last um, several years, um, it, it shows steady improvement in most of the areas. The, the gray wavy line at the top is our target. Um, the yellow line is the recommended area um, or target level. Um, and as you can see, the dark blue was where we um, reached back in 2020. So steady improvement, um, a couple of areas that we, we know have deteriorated. We've invested hugely in Info, our um, asset management system. Um, we've also invested in good condition assessment and resourcing around maintenance planning. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this steady improvement. Next slide. This was the score from last year's report. This is essentially the ACOM report. And um, again, happy to report we've increased uh, significantly. A 2% improvement doesn't sound much, but it is considered significant when we look at the 17 aspects that we uh, we need to perform against. Um, so it, it's really giving us a, a, um, a greater confidence that we're, we're moving in the right direction, that the changes we've made in the way we manage our assets are making a difference. Um, and that does turn into a dollar saving at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So, however, there are some areas that we still need to focus on and we, we will continue to do that. So the strengths that were highlighted in the report are listed there. The three I've highlighted in yellow really just give you an indication of the ones that we still feel we need to make more headway in. So asset condition assessment, we certainly a lot better at that. Um, our challenge is obviously getting around all of our assets in the annual frequency that we need to, um, and to make sure we do that um, thoroughly and, and we risk assess based on what we find. So that that is a key area that we'll continue to work on. Um, and then of course, improvement planning. And the next slide, we really have highlighted about two or three um, opportunities, asset register data. We know that our asset data is not as good as it could be, partly because of the transfer from the old system conquest into Info, um, and we're working hard to make sure that we fill in the gaps and blanks. That is a key priority, as well as information service. Next slide. 
So here really, um, in summary, I guess we can say well, we've got a few key areas to work on, um, the ones I've mentioned, and um, we have a, a plan on a page process. So each one of those aspects has a, a detailed action plan. The continuous improvement governance group is responsible for developing it and overseeing the implementation of those plans. Um, and they will be part of our annual plan as we move forward. And that's really all I've got to cover on that subject. Any questions, please? Thank you. No, no sorry, no. Oh. What is fencing classed as an essay? Because you do a massive amount and quite huge. Yeah, I, I actually can't answer that question. I'm not sure. I'll check and get back to you if I may. generally not our asset because it's gone onto someone's farm so it's the asset that belongs to the farm as a general rule you Adam yeah <laughs> is farming is, is fencing an asset or not uh through you Mr Chim uh fencing is is um it, it is the landowners asset it's recorded on our system um, because we have reporting requirements um, against our catchment program and also we have ongoing maintenance requirements for the catchment program in terms of inspecting fences and making sure that they are still you know providing the service that's expected um, but the fence remains with the land i think other than on our scheme land yeah <laughs> on our scheme land of course it's ours yeah so there is instances where we fence on our own land we're the landowner, we own the fence. Is that what you're going to, what you're intimating at, Adam? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Greg. Um, it's collaboration with doing the fence. So who maintains it? Does it go back to the landowner once once it's done? Oh, yeah. We do have a small catchment maintenance program. Um, and we've heard this several times today around long-term plan discussions. Um, one of the discussions will be, Looking to open is is looking at our longer term maintenance of our programs. Oh, sorry, of our of our um, catchment programs, um, because yeah, it, it, certainly council has got an interest in making sure that um, we have long term performance um, of our investment in terms of retiring. So, um, in due course, we'll have that conversation. Yeah, you will see in the in the catchment report there's a breakdown of maintenance program versus catchment UX program, so that gives you an indication of relativities. That we have currently in our budgets. Just, just on asset ownership, um, the case that we've been dealing with, I won't name um, recently, um, um, about who owns what asset. Um, our solicitor mentioned, is it the Bigley case or whatever? It's the only, there's only one case about assets. I wonder if you could get a copy of that to me. Um, appreciate being able to read it. Okay. Just a contribution to the discussion about fence maintenance, um, Carl, and you think about how much fencing has been done to date and how much will be done over the next 80 years. I think it's um, completely unrealistic for this organisation to be helping farmers maintain those fences. If they've had a, a ratepayer contribution, public funds to help construct a fence on their property, the very least they can do is maintain it, and we've got a role to help them uh, make sure they do that. But um, oh yeah, I, I'm not. We, we've got some old historic obligations, if I recall correctly, Greg, with some of those earlier schemes. Um, but um, but yeah, going forward, I don't think we should be chucking even one cent at, at maintenance costs. It's Any more questions? I just sort of where Stu's leading there, uh, you know, like. 40 odd years ago, I fenced the old river and drains and uh, creeks, the lake, everything. And I didn't ask for a handout from anybody else because it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think going forward, as Stu says, we can't afford as a region to be subsidising people to do the right thing um, to the extent that I think we have in the past. So it's, I think it's a discussion we need to have with our community as, as to what, um, if any, support we need to give. 
Um, just just so I'm clear, aren't, aren't most of the projects we do, uh, the fencing is provided by the landowner as their contribution? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, sometimes it's a big rent and kind contribution. It's, it's right. a, it is a cost-effective way for the landowner to meet their, um, right. their, their share of the their project, but not all the time. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, my point of view with that would have been um, hopefully we can do a bit better in um, the planning and the um, information systems where um, there's, and I know that's hard with earthquakes, you've mentioned before, earthquakes mm. and all of a sudden priorities have to come online to infrastructure. And so it's, it's in a difficult place. So you're never going to be perfect, but we have to be as good as we can in that place. And that's about all we can do. Yep. So thank you, Dave. Cheers. Okay. Um, so um, the report of the asset management, maturity and assessment. Bruce and Tipper, thank you. All in favour? Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, thank, thank you, Mr Chair. So, um, so that does conclude our agenda for today. Um, and so Look, it's, it's designed to provide you with an overview of what is quite a complex um, and involved work program um, across integrated catchment management. Um, we do try to mix it up a bit across meetings in terms of providing focus on different areas, um, but also to ensure that you're aware of how work programs are going. And obviously what you've got a sense of today is that um, there is a lot of work happening, um, certainly a lot of impacts in terms of the, um, the summer that we've had um, and the win winter that we continue to have. Um, and we'll continue to keep you updated in terms of um, what we need to do going forward to um, plan, prioritise and fund that work. Um, in terms of our meeting in September, um, as I think was um, discussed, so our biosecurity program has an annual reporting cycle where they have a detailed annual report will be provided um, to that meeting, um, as well as a detailed operational plan um, for the year period, which will be provided for you all um, as well for your information. Um, also coming up um, is as part of the Natural Heritage Partnership Program, we have the Environmental Initiatives Fund. Um, so that's our, our middle of the road um, funding with the Natural Heritage um, Fund being the larger fund and our small scale fund being at the other end. Um, so this committee will be um, will be being asked to make a decision um, on um, applicants to the Environmental Initiatives Fund. Before we actually get to that meeting, um, we will be arranging a workshop with yourselves um, to go through that particular fund and the broader Natural Heritage Partnership Program. Um, so you have an opportunity to understand how it works, um, the criteria that are applied, and ultimately what you'll see before the meeting um, in September. So watch the space for a workshop coming through. Um, and also just through you, Mr Chair, I'm always happy to receive um, feedback on how we put this agenda together to make sure it's as worthwhile um, for yourselves as, as the committee members. Um, and my last comment is just to appreciate your all appreciation to the ICM team and the staff that's been expressed today. Um, it's been a hell of a few months um, and for several it's been more months than that. Um, and I know they, they really appreciate the acknowledgement um, of just this how it's been and the hard work that they're doing. So thank you for that. How we're going to talk to the catchment community in three months and now just just saying are we any further or six yep. months in? no but three right. months into that four, yeah. six months into the council <laughs> so we have you may have picked up we have a special meeting of icmc scheduled for 13th of june um that'll be a single item meeting to consider that particular item yep thank you okay i'll close we open with the cutter here so i'll close with the cutter here yep. una here una here Una hia mai te rupu, upu, tapu nui, ki waiata, ki mama, te nako, te tinana, te hini naro, e te ara, ta takatu, koya ra e rongo, e faka iria, aki ri runga, ke tina, tina, umi, huie, taikia. I'll just call the meeting closed. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Thanks very much.